Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I, I want to thank the STEM Alliance for the chance to be able to, to be here and organize such an event. Um, we've been long supporters of this space, as I, I hope people know, and we've been a partner of this STEM Alliance network for several years um, and contributing indeed to it's the STEM stills gap in Europe. So I'm really excited to be able to be here today with such an audience and share a little bit more about some of our efforts across Europe and particularly in the digital transformation context. Uh, this is a space that I work on across different industries. And one of the most exciting ones, of course, is the opportunities that we've had in education. Uh, that's a collaborative experience that we can't do on our own. So it requires cooperation with communities like this, with educators and with reading researchers uh, across the world. Uh, we've learned a lot over the past few years. And I'm excited about being able to share some of that with you today. So like I said, I wanted to talk about the uh, opportunity in digital transformation. We've seen over the past few years, you know, a marked change in this space. You know, the pandemic, I think, has been discussed already to some extent, but, you know, we really learned a lot about the opportunities that we had in the digital context, you know, how dependent some communities would be and others who were left behind in that space and opportunities to really connect more and leverage some of the remote learning opportunities that we had. Our CEO talks about you know, seeing two month, two years of digital transformation in two months at the outset of the pandemic. And I think one of the places that was most tangible when people could see it up front was really in the education context, how we were able to see a continuity there uh, to some degree of learning in the classroom that then shifted remotely. We're really, you know, we had to develop tools much quicker than before. We learned a lot about some of the advantages and disadvantages of those tools so that we could build in additional improvements teachers learned a lot more, educators and communities all around the world. You know, we learned more about the limitations that we have in that space, but also some of the big opportunities. And I hope I have a chance to speak a little bit more about that today. Schools pivoted at the beginning of this to hybrid learning rather successfully. Um, I think there was a need for that naturally, but uh, in growing pains along the way. I think anybody who's a parent or had children in school saw some of the struggles that we had with adapting to these technologies very quickly. Uh, and teachers had a lot of learning to do in that space. I mentioned earlier in my presentation many times mm -hmm. collaboration. And you have experience in different sectors. So can you tell us what's your opinion on collaboration between private and public sector? Is it strong enough? And mm -hmm. what can we do to improve it? Oops. I think we can always try harder to make it better. I think our experience has been that none of this works with us doing it alone. We are not experts in the same space that many of our customers, particularly in the education sector, have much, much closer experience to local needs and teacher challenges. Uh, we work very closely with our customers in that space, whether it's schools, whether it's public institutions, whether it's cities and you know, universities and the like. So we try to get as close as possible to understand better what the needs are of these communities that are most engaged, but we can always improve it. Um, it's one of those things that we cannot do this on our own as a company uh, with our tools. Uh, we cannot build tools that are successful without input from the education community. And that includes students as well. Um, we do learn as we go. It's a feedback loop. Uh, you know, we can have the development side of things and we're seeing even in an employment context, the type of experts that we need to hire within Microsoft increasingly need to have experience from these sectors as well. So we've been over the past few years in particular, really embedding more of our employees into this space so that you can see, you know, how do we develop these tools in a way that makes sense? You know, engineers have different perspectives on that sometimes than teachers and students. We may come out with a tool that we think is brilliant and technologically powerful, but if their use case isn't there, if the intuitiveness isn't there, if the practicalities aren't there, that, that's not successful. So it's become, I think, definitely more pronounced over the past few years, especially as we're seeing more rollout of these tools and the need for those tools. I think it's been more embedded than ever and a feedback loop that has to be done together. The private sector can't do this alone. I don't think the public sector can do this alone. Uh, so from our side, it's absolutely, absolutely imperative. Exactly. During one of the sessions today, it was mentioned that it takes two to tango. And at the end of the very same session, <laughs> the, the, the conclusion was that not even two. We need more. We need students. We need families. So it's very important to put a lot of emphasis on collaboration. So. I'm, I'm very happy that you also shared your, your opinion. I think one of the things I was beginning to say is this wasn't a digital transformation 
uh, that occurred only in the education sector. It occurred across industries. And those industries, as more and more workloads went online, as more and more of the way folks were doing business was leveraging cloud technologies and different tools. And as we were trying to emerge from the pandemic, we want to build back better, leveraging that digital transformation opportunity. So we also saw some of the skills shortages that would be in that space as you know, automotive industries, manufacturing industries are hiring more and more employees that are engaged in digital aspects of those transformation journeys, there's a skills gap that has emerged. You know, we think that the commission and others have estimated there could be 4.3 million jobs left unfulfilled by 2030 due to a tech skills shortage. Um, we think on the twin transition and the green side, as well as on the digital side, over 75% of EU enterprises are expected to take up cloud computing, big data, and AI by 2030. Not only be successful if they have the talent and access to skills that are needed for those uh, endeavors to be successful. So it's been an opportunity that the European Commission and others have highlighted, one that we see very similarly uh, across the data we have in our different segments and customer segments. And I think as we go more digital, one of the areas that you're seeing an increasing amount of need for these skills is in cybersecurity. As that tech landscape expands, there's new opportunities for both the good players and the bad players. And we're seeing more challenges in that space and companies trying to hire to make sure that they have the skills in place as they expand digitally, they're not becoming more vulnerable, that they're actually making sure that these things are done in a secure fashion and the trust is there that we need. But the bad news, is that there is a skill shortage in this space. It was last year we announced as part of an effort to address that gap, uh, a global expansion of our cybersecurity skills initiative is now over in 23 additional countries around the world, 12 in Europe in particular. And this is where we're looking to work with local education institutions, governments, nonprofits to develop cybersecurity skills programs that fit the unique needs of this market while also expanding access to some of the tools that are available today. So we have free training for cybersecurity pathways on our LinkedIn learning platform and offering free security courses on our Microsoft Learn platform. Some of this is helpful towards getting to the type of certifications that are increasingly recognized in the jobs market or the cybersecurity market. But we want to make sure that this is across the spectrum. This is not just the highly most sophisticated type of uh, attack vector uh, protections that could be built in, but the cyber hygiene that's necessary for anyone engaged in these technologies. I don't think there's any uh, disagreement that if you think about it in an education context, um, especially as more and more students are online, you know, those need to be the type of safe and secure spaces uh, for teachers to have the trust that you know they're speaking to the right audience and children are having the right experience. Another area where we've seen a gap emerge, and I think it's one that's more pronounced since the pandemic, as we build back and recover from the pandemic, and we have global initiatives aimed at sustainability goals in particular. Uh, there's a jobs gap there as well. You know, According to our LinkedIn data, green jobs grew at an annual rate of 8% between 2015 and 2021, but the talent pool only grew at a rate of 6%. So while we have thousands and thousands of companies that have announced actions to lower greenhouse gas emissions, and you know more, of a, more than a third, I think now of the world's largest companies have net zero targets, we're only gonna get there if we have the digital skills and the green skills that are necessary to achieving that type of sustainable world. So we've highlighted the urgency to close this sustainability skills gap and set up additional course and trainings and working with educators in that space to release some of those training materials and make sure that we're closing that gap that had existed previously. We think that these two sets of skills are going to be critical to achieving any of the sustainable and digital transformation challenges that we have coming up. But our approach to students, because you, you asked me about that earlier, is you know we want to empower every student on the planet, just like we want to empower every organization on the planet to achieve more. This requires skills. It requires access to these tools and technologies. If we're going to set up these economies of the future that are increasingly digital, we're only going to be successful if students across the learning spectrum have access to the different skills in that space. And that doesn't mean just coding languages and some of the more sophisticated computer science skills, but you know, digital literacy across the board, uh, starting from a very early age and continuing beyond you know, primary and secondary education. 
uh, we're very excited about some of the opportunities that digital technologies have for lifelong learning, seeing you know, folks that are making career pivots in this space, launching new businesses and leveraging the digital tools that make that possible. You can only do that if you have an awareness of what's out there and how to use it. So primary education level, it starts with sparking curiosity with STEM and computer science programs, of course. We have some exciting solutions that, that we like to uh, engage with teachers on, particularly around Minecraft and some of our Office 365 tools. When we get to secondary education, we're developing more and more productivity skills with computational thinking and analytics, trying to grow that knowledge base and competence on emerging technologies for future work. Some of that you can see potentially if you've used Microsoft Teams and some of our Azure cloud technologies. When we get to higher education, I think the focus is also on employability, right? With technical skilling that I mentioned earlier, some of the hands-on experiences, industry certifications and pathways to these new jobs that are emerging across all different types of industries. A lot of our solutions there can be found on you know, our large coding platform, GitHub, but Azure certification, cybersecurity and sustainability learning paths, and a lot of the coursework we've made increasingly available on LinkedIn Learning. I'm glad that you asked at the outset, you know, what our role is here in terms of collaboration. And I spoke a bit to that, you know, but we really need to collaboratively envision and create this intentional culture of innovation and learning. That there are shared goals that engage the community, including leaders, educators, and all stakeholders to really help lead that change. Again, we're only going to be successful if we do that together. And if we're helping all students achieve their potential by taking a student centered approach to explore these aspects, curriculum, assessment devices, spaces with a focus on understanding and meeting the needs of all students. Hopefully we're getting better at creating these, what we consider intelligent environments. Uh, to be successful, I think important word that I, I haven't mentioned yet is, is equity and inclusion. You know, one of the things we learned from the pandemic is that the experience of digital transformation and staying connected, whether it was with loved ones or an employment context or education, it was still quite mixed depending on your access to these tools. Uh, it was a much different experience for those students that had access to the latest equipment and some of the latest software and teachers that had been trained in those spaces with high degrees of internet connectivity to communities where there wasn't the same levels of connectivity or there wasn't the same investment in the right hardware and some of the software. And that creates an additional gap of sorts and, and a missed opportunity. So. Some of the investments that governments have made, and I think this has been reflected in the European Commission's efforts, are really targeting that learning that we had, that this might have been a good experience for many. Um, and thankfully, there were these digital technologies we could fall back on, but it also highlighted some problematic divides that we had there. And some of the monies that we've looked to invest uh, at a government level into those communities post pandemic, I, I think it's laudable that the Commission and others have recognized that need. And, closing that divide so that when we emerge from this more successfully, we emerge from these crises, we have a better foundation for really driving those, those jobs and skills of the future. Um, so I'm gonna conclude uh, till I can answer some of the questions, but you know we do see this as an urgent need and why we continue to be keen to be a part of these conversations, particularly in the STEM Alliance and, and beyond Europe to bridge that gap. And, and the European Commission's skills agenda, the Youth Employment Support Package or the Pact for Skills, you know, we think these are crucial at a time when new generation of tech has become essential for people's personal progress, and not least of which young graduates and job seekers. So we don't think this process is easy by any means, and it's important that we get it right, particularly in the education sector. If we're going to get education right in the broader industrial sectors, and we think about employability and the cybersecurity and sustainability challenges that I mentioned earlier, um, we're only gonna be successful if we have access to the skills that are needed to succeed. We have an idea of what we see from data and what we build into our tools, but we can't do it alone. And we certainly work and look to work with and look to policymakers, educators, and students to understand if we're building the right tools and how we can continue to do that better so that we're meeting these needs and achieving these goals together. So I will stop there and hopefully able to take a few questions. Many thanks, Mr. Rollison, for, for sharing your in, insights on, on digital transformation. It's very interesting to hear that. And we know that the technology is rapidly changing. So it's also important for all of us to keep up with new requirements and work on our own digital skills. So uh, you did mention 
uh, at one point pandemics. So can you tell us more uh, details about how did this affect digital transformation? From our side, you know, we saw companies with employees, of course, that were working from home. So it's easy to say that, you know, they were using Microsoft Teams more and more to stay in touch and have meetings. Um, that was exciting. And you know, we rolled out a lot of additional tools very quickly to make that experience better and better. But we also saw companies increasingly shifting workloads to the cloud, you know, leveraging some of the tools that are available there. Now, I mentioned that because to make any of that work, you need to have employees who understand where the possibilities are. They understand how to use those tools. They understand how they can find efficiencies with some of these new IT products. And that requires certifications and, and a background in that space. If you then pivot to the education side of things, of course, there was the remote learning experience that so many were engaged on through a variety of platforms. Teachers had to engage with students differently than, than before, you know, maintaining attention levels, um, maintaining, you know, some of that even missing social dynamic, you know, was, of course, a challenge. But that's almost more on the what I call the Microsoft Teams side, where we were really leveraging a tool there to stay connected. But how you build in all of the additional applications to make sure those experiences at the education level are enriching enough that we're preparing these students for those jobs that others were then engaged in about identifying efficiencies, identifying these spaces. So we learned a lot more about what certifications are, are popular in that space and what certifications are going to be increasingly popular. Um, we saw a, a generation become even more digitally literate very, very quickly. I think the part, though, that I, I've been trying to focus on more is we also saw some of those communities that that could be at risk of being left behind in that space. You know, we see certain platforms and certain types of software that may work well on the latest and greatest set of hardware. But what about the tools that are available for those communities that don't have access to that hardware, or don't have that infrastructure in place? Um, you know, we can contribute a lot to that space and, and we continue to, but it comes back to the collaboration point that you mentioned. You know, some of the most exciting things that we have here will only be possible if we have the right level of infrastructure and connectivity. So there's a role to play there with the public sector and the private sector to make sure we're all connected. And then on top of that, are we building the right solutions that help teach these skills in the best way? And then once those skills are there, we have a more employable workforce that can really leverage the digital transformation moving forward. So I think digital transformation in the education sector is almost arguably in some ways more important than elsewhere because it won't be successful across those other industries that we get you know very excited about if you don't have a workforce that's adequately trained and adequately skilled at being able to leverage those new opportunities and you can't create that workforce if anyone is left behind if we're creating additional gaps in that space so it's a it's a broad spectrum that that we learned from and we had to move really really quickly Exactly. And there are many, many important topics we mentioned today, and they're all uh, supporting each other. So we do not look at them as separate issues, but they all need to be seen from, from one perspective. And uh, it's very, very good to hear that you're also working on uh, involving students from uh, different communities and also diversity is one of your aims. But when it comes to skills, uh, to be more precise, what skills are more and more in demand in your sector? More and more in our sector, I and mean, it, gets, it gets very broad. I think it's, it's an exciting question because if you asked me 10 years ago, we could point to potentially uh, specific coding languages that were at the cutting edge of new application development and, and the like. Now we're seeing some of our automotive customers, our manufacturing customers, hiring a greater and greater percentage of data scientists and engineers with cloud architecture skill sets so that as the automotive industry is transforming and increasingly building out more connected cars, for example, you know, the type of employees they need are much different than in the past. Even mechanics and the like have new ways of identifying problems in those spaces. If you think of manufacturing assembly lines and the type of employees you needed to make those more, more and more successfully, you know, automation is changing that space, but behind that automation are still engineers, data scientists, that are needed to be able to keep those efficiencies moving forward. Companies are, you know, we're really excited about the data opportunity that's out there. Companies are identifying, you know, collecting and generating more and more amounts of data. But that in itself isn't very valuable if you don't have the skills, the tools, and the workforce to be able to unlock 
the insights to that, to be able to say, you know, this is the pattern we've seen and there's a new business opportunity here. There's a new efficiency here. And on that space, it's very, very much um, no longer just being able to code, uh, but being able to understand and ask the right questions from a data science perspective of, well, what can we learn from this data? How will we learn it? What type of tools can we apply to that? So it's not just the sometimes, I would never want to say it's a cliche, but it's not just coders that we're looking for, but it's really more and more certifications in a cyber skilling context, because all of those industries are becoming more digital. It's just a fact that that becomes a space that can be attacked more easily. Uh, so you need to build it, build in more of that resilience and more of that protection. So cyber skilling uh, in particular has gone dramatically up. And as we see more and more of a global effort to address the climate change and, and environmental concerns, we're seeing a gap there in the sustainability space as well. You know, we can only be successful if we can also be successful, or we can be successful addressing that problem if we can measure the problem and understand the problem. And a lot of that can be done through data. But again, it requires the right type of data science, skilling, and uh, engineering resources to be successful. So my simple answer would be, I think coding will always be continually important and there are new and exciting spaces there, but we're also seeing more of a digital transformation set of certifications and skilling that goes beyond coding more into data science. And I think we're also seeing, even at a much more local level, just more familiarity with basic digital technologies that are more necessary than ever before. If you think, I always like to tell the personal story of someone like my mother, who was a social worker who met clients face to face the pandemic changed that. And now she has had to become more effective at using video conferencing solutions. And that may sound simple to all of us because we're doing it here today, but for many in different stages of their career, that, that's not that's a very, very new technology. If you think of local hairdressers and the like, being able to automate calendar systems and reservation systems, do you have the skills that are necessary to understand that, to continue to expand your business and see clients? Um, that's a part of the education story that I think we need to tell as well.